via uh, just via context that it's not your site, you know. But yeah, it's a it's a good concern. The other thing you could do is you could uh, use other styling mechanisms. Um, Via uh, we haven't talked about class yet in CSS, but you could assign classes to all your external links to make them look different. And in that way, it's a very subtle way, but eventually people will sort of get the idea, hey, that's an external site. There's no problem to linking to another site. That, that's not a copyright issue. You don't need to say anything. Uh, anyone can link to any site on the web that they want to. Now, you certainly can't do anything to um, subvert if they have a login scheme or something that requires you to be a member of the site or, or whatever. Like, um, like for example, like the New York Times. I know that you can like maybe read like the first paragraph of some articles, but you need to be a subscriber to read the whole thing or or whatever. You couldn't do anything to like get around. You you couldn't do anything to get around there. They call it a paywall. All right, but you certainly could link to something that is publicly available without any any uh, legal legal ramifications. Yeah, well, you're doing. Yeah, yeah, you're you're fine as far as creating links go. Oh, hi. This is Mike. I'm ready to start if you haven't already started. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I graded lab something yesterday. <laughs> Lab 4, I think it was. And um, one problem that a number of people had was with the, with the style sheet. And, and, and again, um, I, can, I can appreciate that, that sometimes the instructions aren't 100% clear or whatever. Um, and again, that's why I, I sort of adopt the no-fault policy. If it's a misunderstanding and um, th there's an issue with it, then, um, okay, well, well, we'll talk about it and we'll, we'll do it over again. Um, you, you know, it's funny. Uh, one of the great cliches that people say is you learn from your mistakes. And I don't know if that's necessarily true, right? I mean, I would think if that were true, the Cleveland Browns would be like the best football team in history by now, you know? So you don't always learn from your mistakes. You learn from your mistakes if you go back and think about, OK, what was wrong with it? What could I do to correct it? And all that. So that's the necessary part of learning from, from your mistakes. And in addition, if you think about in a job environment, if your boss gave you instructions to do something and you didn't do it the way that was expected, all right? Would it simply end there? It's like, no. The boss would say, okay, you need to correct this, that, or the other. And it might be that the boss didn't give you clear instructions. All right? The boss thought they were clear instructions, but they weren't. Or it might be that you made a mistake or whatever. So that's why I sort of adopt a no-fault policy. So if you turn in an assignment and it's not, um, it, you know, there, there's some issue with it, um, then I, I, I'm more than happy to give you the opportunity to, to rework it. All right? It does make for more work for me, because I have to grade, in some cases, a couple of submissions instead of just one submission. And I do apologize for that. That, that sometimes slows me down in keeping up to date. My goal is always to have stuff graded within a week of the due date all right, uh, of something. So the lab four that was due last week, on Wednesday, I graded on Wednesday of week five. So I've kind of caught back up. I fell a little behind at the beginning of, of the semester. At any rate, the lab with the style sheets, a lot of people made one mistake one way or another. All right? They, they, they did something one way or another. And it largely related to not the style code, but where the style code was to be put. Because for this assignment, you were to create a separate CSS file and put it in, I think I said, a couple of pages All right, from a previous example. 
So let's take a look at what I mean, and let's take a look at why that that's important. You know, I don't, you know, I was the kind of student in school that was always asking why. If the teacher told me that their way of doing something was better, I didn't believe them. Why, why, would, I, why would I believe them? You need to show it to me. You, mean, you need to prove it to me that it's a better way to do it. So I try to do the same thing for my students. I don't want you to, to do things just because, well, this is the way I said to do them. I want you to do them because you recognize, hey, there's a lot of advantages to doing it this way. So let's look at the example we did, I think it was last week. All right, my little ski example. And again, the pages aren't necessarily the most beautiful in the world. But there's page one, then we have page two. Now, let's look at the files that are involved here. All right. We'll open up one of the HTML files to start. We'll get back to the other one um, in a minute here. So if I open up one of the HTML files, I'm also going to open up the CSS file. Notice first off that the CSS and the HTML are in separate files. All right. There's a file that contains the CSS. There's a file that contains the HTML. But the two files have to talk to each other. And they talk to each other via oops, this link. So my expectations for this assignment would be that you would create a file that only contained the CSS code. And then you would link to that file from within your HTML document. So in this case, I have oops, I have, I think, an image, a CSS file, and two HTML files in this example from last Thursday. All right, HTML file, HTML file, CSS file, then I have a separate folder for images. Now, a couple things to observe. Here's the here's typical errors that people made. All right, one error that people made is they put the style tags in the CSS file. You don't put the style tags in the CSS file if the CSS is in its own file. There's no need to. So I don't need to do this. All right. By virtue of it being in its own file, the browser knows that that's CSS code based on the manner in which we link to it. So. It would ignore that tag, right? Worse than ignoring it, it would think it's CSS, it would think that that HTML tag was CSS and kind of throw its arms up and give up. So, yeah. So if I put this in here and I put this in here, if I go and view that page, I don't get my CSS. Okay. Because, you know, because the browser does different things when it gets errors. At some point, like in this case, it gets an error like that, it throws up its arms, it says, that's not CSS code, I don't know what to do with it, and it dies. In other cases, other things happen, but in this particular case, it's not going to get the CSS. All right. So when it's in a separate file, there's no style tag. Likewise, 
if we look back at the HTML, there's no style tag here either. You know, again, I wouldn't do this either. The very similar thing happens to before. It thinks that that's style code within there when it's not, and it blows up. Instead, what I have is I have link, rel equals style sheet, type equals text CSS, href equals style.css. Now, by virtue of that rel equals style sheet, type equals CSS, that's how the browser knows that that chunk of code in that file is CSS. So you don't need to put the style tag in there. Yes? I might have asked this before, but I the answer. Uh -huh. Is there a, a type other than text slash CSS? Yes. There, there's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of potential things that that could be. But for, for, for style sheets, it will be text slash, text slash CSS. Just like rel. There's different things that rel could be as well. And it needs to be that. And that identifies to the browser, hey, we're dealing with CSS code. All right, go from there. So a lot of people had their style code right in the HTML page. In other words, a lot of people did this. Style and style and didn't do the link but put their style code in the page. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is when we're dealing with more than one page. All right? Because if I have the style code embedded within each page, if something about that style code changes it, I have to go and change it on every page. All right? By putting it in an external file, I can use that same link on all my pages on my website. So it's not just me being picky and saying I didn't want it that way. It's that it's better to do it this way. All right? Because then when I have the second page, ski2.html, if I look at this guy in Notepad, you'll notice that I'm linking to the exact same style sheet. And that's a good thing. That's very important because it makes it easier to change. Remember, almost all of our good practices as software developers stems from the idea that it's easy to change. So I come around and I say, you know what? It doesn't really make sense to have green for a, for a skiing website. You know, you don't ski when it's green outside. All right, let's go and let's make the background color blue. I don't know if blue's any better, but it's different at least. All right. I can go and save that one change in one file and both my files are changed then. All right. Yes. You can. The, the question was, is could you have more than one CSS uh, file uh, on a website? And the answer is you can. Um, in fact, you, you do in a couple of cases. All right. One case is, and we'll talk about this at some point in the semester, is that um, sometimes you may have, you might want the same content on your website if viewed on a computer versus viewed on a smartphone. But you may want it to look different. In which case, you can, through having, simply having different CSS files, you can make one of them work for the desktop machine, one of them work for a mobile device. So that would be one case where you'd have two different CSS files. Another case is if there's an oddball page. A page or two that just like are sort of different than the rest. 
What I'm thinking of is like if you've ever gone to like a news site or even something like Google Maps, all right, when you go to say that you want to print a page, it often looks different than the regular website, all right. Um, it will, for example, typically just be plain black font on a white background. Um, images are eliminated. Uh, it's just, just more, more simple. So like if I go to the New York Times, I may see with all the navigation and all that, if I go to print it, the article might look different. That very well might be the same HTML file with simply a different style sheet applied to it. So if you have oddball pages that sort of fit the mold, for the most part, th those are the two main reasons I could think of where you'd have more than one style sheet. Um, you can actually apply multiple style sheets to the same page even. All right, if again, maybe it's not a total oddball page, but there's a couple things that you want to treat a little differently. For the most part though, <coughs> a, a basic design principle is that you want uh, a level of consistency to your, pa to your pages. You want the same thing on different pages to look the same, right? You want the navigation section to look consistent. If, it, if the navigation goes, uh, is on the left side of the screen, you want it on all your pages on the left side of the screen. If the navigation is a certain color scheme, you want that certain color scheme. So for the most part, you're talking about one main style sheet probably with a handful of exceptions thrown in um, for, for in, in other cases. So the mistakes people made, and again, a lot of people made the mistakes. I was, I might have been cutting and pasting at some point um, yesterday. Um, but uh, the mistakes people made are number one, they embedded the CSS code right in the HTML. So they put the style tag in there. Which is wrong because then you'd have to do that all, all the pages on your site. And if you wanted to change something, you'd have to change all of them. What's well, going to happen, you're going to forget to change one and you're going to have a page that looks inconsistent. Yes? You can have a link with the style code in there. If you wanted to make a change to something different on the one page. You could put a style tag on a page in addition if you wanted to, again, tweak one particular element on this oddball page, you could do that. All right. But sort of like, you know, the, these are sort of, you know, what, what they call a lot of times in, in software development edge cases. You know, not like the normal standard practice. These are like exceptions, all right? So for the most part, you're going to have a single style sheet or in the case of mobile, maybe two style sheets that um, define the way your site is going to look. And then you might do some extra things uh, in some additional cases. All right. Um, so what people did is a lot of people put their code right in here. A lot of people included a style tag in the external file or wrapped their link in a style tag. All right. That's, a, that's the second sort of problem people had. And another thing that people did is with this href pointed to the file incorrectly. So like if you notice here, oops. I say href equals style.css because there's no folders or anything in front of that. All right. The assumption is it's in the same folder as a web page, which in this case it is. All right. That's a good practice to do, um, especially if you're a little uncomfortable with the directories and, and things like that. Keep it all on one page. You just need to put the name of the file there. All right. It should never say something like C program files user Mike Zellers slash. It should never say that as uh, the href because that's not going to work when I go and load it on my machine. 
All right. So take a look. Chances are, if you got points off for that, it was one of for those three or four reasons. Now, there might be a couple exceptions that I can't quite remember. So take a look at it. Feel free to resubmit it. Simply put it back in the, in the same Dropbox. If you have questions, if after hearing this you go back and look at your lab and you don't really see what's wrong with it or it doesn't seem to fit sort of the typical problems that I described, then just shoot me an email and I can take a look at it and maybe comment on your specific case. All right. So, for the most part, from now on, do all your style sheets as external style sheets. All right. Again, simply for the advantage of being able to go in and make the change in one place. Now, what does that mean? That means that for some pages, certain style elements will never apply. I could have code for an H2 in my style sheet, and I could have a page that there's no H2s on. No harm, no foul. All right. If there was an H2 on the page, it would style it this way. If there's no H2 on the page, then nothing gets that style rule. It's not like there's going to be an error or anything. Questions about that? So if you got five out of five, that means that in essence you did it correct. I may have had a commented or two uh, about this, that, or the other. All right, make sure you pay attention to that. If you got less than five out of five, <coughs> in most cases it was because of this. All right, so take a look at it, see if you can correct it, resubmit it, and you'll be in good shape. All right. I want to, any que questions about that before we put that one to rest and go on to the next part of it? Okay. Last time, we talked about what makes a good website and what makes a bad website. And possibly surprising or possibly not, we did not say anything about the font, about the colors of the page, about whether there's background images, about should it be one column or two columns. We didn't say much about the appearance of it. In other words, what most people think about web design as. We hardly said a word about any of that. All right. What did we say? Content is king. Yeah, we said number one, content is king. All right. Number two. We said that satisfying, and maybe satisfying isn't the right word, maybe helping to satisfy or something along those words is better. Our user goals. Satisfying our organization's goals. I'm going to use the word organization whether we're talking about a company, a business, an institution like a school. Um, even if we're talking about a person, all right, like if you were an author, for example, you know. It just, it's just a simple way to put it then to say every time I'm talking about the organization to say, the institution, the school, the business, the person, whatever. That's what I mean. When I say organization, know that I mean, you know, the person on whose behalf the website is being created. All right? We don't? Okay. Let me put that dot cam back up. All right. Content is king. Satisfying user goals. Satisfying organizational goals. And the other thing that we said is, again, a rule of 
any form of communication, know your audience. And maybe sometimes we can even define our audience. Sort of the corollary to this one is avoid trying to be all things to all people. Pick your target audience and focus on their goals. So, these are the things that we talked about to sort of define what constitutes good web design. Websites that provide good content that users can use to satisfy their goals and users that can use or the organization gets their goals satisfied as well, and we're really targeting the appropriate audience, and we're doing it effectively. Yes? Would simplicity fit in there? I don't know. What do you think? Okay. Albert Einstein said, because simplicity is a great topic, Albert Einstein said things should be made as simple as they can be, but no simpler. Something along those lines. I'm not Einstein, so forgive me. Maybe he even said it in German, I don't know. but. Things should be made as simple as they can be, but no simpler. So to answer your question, is simplicity a goal? Probably in one form or another, to make it as simple as it can be. But there can be cases of if you're dealing with a truly complicated topic, all right, it may not be possible to make it simple without dumbing down the topic, in which case you're not really addressing the needs. So, what I would say is, how simple or complex you make the site is wrapped up, is contained in satisfying the user goals, right? It, so, that's sort of implied, because if people can't find content is king, or queen, but if the king and queen are hiding somewhere in exile and you can't find them, doesn't do you any good, right? So I would say the relative simplicity slash complexity of a site falls under the category of satisfying the user goals. If it is too complex of a navigation, for example, is typically what people talk about, but there's also the writing style and all that. If it's too complex, it's not going to satisfy the user goals. If it is too simple, believe it or not, it's not going to satisfy the user goals. Now, here's one thing I'll say. All right? Here's one thing I'll say. What do you think the tendency of most people to make websites is? To make things too simple or to make things too complicated? To make things too complicated. You know, it, it's kind of like I give the analogy of exercising. Yeah, there's maybe a couple people in the world that overdo exercise, but that's probably not the problem that most people suffer from. <laughs> All right, so yeah, simplicity is an important thing, but to the degree that it satisfies the goals. So, if we define these sort of as our, our, our point of web design, does that mean that color, layout, fonts, all those things are not important. If we said this is sort of, this, if, 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 we, if we agree that this is our main goals, our main task in developing a website, does that mean things like colors, fonts, 
etc. are not important? No. Why not? How do they fit into this? Okay. Statement was made, you want to make it appealing so people stay on your page. You want to make sure the navigation is clear so people can find things. If your layout of your site is horrible, all right, and people can't find the, the stuff that they want, they're not getting their goal satisfied, all right. Um, if your colors are such that you're putting yellow text on a white background, for example, all right, and the font is so small and is a goofy looking font where people can't read it, all right, then they're not getting their goal solved. If you have so much on your site and so much on your pages that it's hard for people to find the stuff that they want, then that's not good either. My point is, though, let's not put the cart before the horse. All right? Anytime we're communicating something, we have to decide what it is we want to communicate. Then we figure out how we're going to communicate it. All right? The fonts, the colors, the layout relates to how we're going to communicate that. How we are going to emphasize things, how we're going to direct the user's attention. Those things are important, but they're not the first things to decide. The first things to decide is this sort of stuff. To go from a very broad, very conceptual sort of what are the goals, define those, define other things, and we're going to sort of then zero in on the page layout. So yes, the bottom line is the layout is important. The color scheme is important. All those things are important, but they're important because they can help us satisfy our users' goals. Because I don't care how good of taste that you have artistically, People aren't going to go to your site to admire the color scheme that you have. Very, very, very unlikely. People are going there because they probably want some information or some service or, or purchase a product from you or get some information about a topic or something along those lines. Okay, so what... There's a book that I think is available on Safari Books Online, which I don't know, I, I think I've mentioned that in this class, have I? There is, if you go to um, our LC's library site, and this is good for students that are in any IT classes, you can get books by going to our library site, research databases. I usually go to the A to Z list because I know Safari starts with an S. And the first one on the list is Safari Books Online. Now, if you're on campus and you click on this, it recognizes that you're on LCC's campus because this is a subscription service all right we have to pay for it here at LC if you're on campus it's the, the everything's smart enough to know hey you're on campus so you're a subscriber right if you are off campus there's an off campus link that you can click on all right um, and what you have to do then is you have to supply your library card number which is not your student number but it's like a longer like a 14 digit number that's on your library card. And you do that, and you can gain access to it. When you said library card, that confused me. Library card from the public library. No, no uh, your student ID. Yeah, your student ID, which I guess you use for a lot of things, but one of the things you use it for is your library card. All right, so let's go look. I think this book is actually out there. Because the name of the book is The Elements 
of user experience. If I could type, I could pull it up. Yeah, right here. So if you're interested in reading this book, um, you can go for free and start reading. This is good to quote audition books, by the way, too. If you're looking for a book on a particular topic and you're not really sure what's a good book, this gives you a chance to preview it. I don't know, different people have different views of reading stuff um, online, you know. I generally don't like to read long text online, but, you know, some people do a better job at that than I do. At any rate, the model that we're going to use, the, 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 the process that we're going to use to develop our website comes from this book. And it used to be a required book in this class, but it's no longer required because I think I can talk about it on my own. There is a copy of this book in the library, and believe me, it's a quick read. I also have a couple copies I can lend out if people are interested. I mean, you could probably read it in a couple hours if you're a fast reader. All right. So, the methodology, the procedure that they use in creating a website, they come up with, just for ease of memory, they come up with um, five words that all start with S. And I hope I can remember them. If not, I got the book right here, right? So, yeah. Strategy. Scope. Structure. Skeleton. And surface. Now, it looks like I indented that, but that's, that was not intentional. Those are all... One, two, three, four, five steps. Each of these steps brings us closer to having a completed web site and completed web pages. I want to give you an overview of this. Then I want to talk about each step in more detail and talk about what you will do for the design part of your semester project. All right. <coughs> You're going to create a document that has five pieces to it, one for each of these sections, and give an overview of each of them, then we'll talk about each of them more specifically. Strategy involves two things two basic things. Defining goals and defining audience. You know. Certainly can't satisfy users' goals if you don't know what those goals are, right? You can't know what the goals are if you don't know who the audience is, all right? So it's not enough to say that I want to create a website for a jewelry store. You could create a website for a jewelry store and have a lot of goals, all right? One of your goals might be to sell products online, to increase revenue by selling products online. Another goal might be, hey, I know people aren't going to pay a few thousand dollars to buy something online, but I want to get them into my store so that they can see it and be dazzled by it in person and decide to buy it. Those are two distinct strategies that you could take if you were running an online jewelry store. So in the strategy section, it's about 
defining two things closely related, the purpose of your site and the goals of the site. That might be just two ways of saying the same thing. And defining your audience. The scope part relates to defining what can be called the requirements for the site. Another way to put it is what content are we going to put on the site. The structure portion of it relates to the organization. Sort of on a page level. In the requirements phase, I might identify a hundred things that I want on my website. Does that mean I have a hundred pages? No. Does that mean that I have one page with a hundred things on it? Probably also no. So if I have a hundred pieces of content I want on my website, I probably have somewhere between one to a hundred pages. We know one's not the right answer. We know the hundred's not a right answer. In this phase, in the structure phase, you look at your content and you try to decide what's the best way to organize it in a logical fashion that will help people be able to find it. The skeleton phase of the site relates to the organization of an individual page. So the structure, we decide what pages we're going to have. In the skeleton phase, we talk about the organization of individual pages. If you go to any site, you can see that there's a very consistent skeleton or shell for every page on the site. All right. There might be some pages that look a little different, but there's a sort of a basic skeleton that gets filled in. So here's Amazon. This is Amazon's home page. Let's go in and let's look for books. All right. Alan Lightman. Notice what we have here. I did a search for an author. What do we have here? Well, we have Amazon's logo. We have a place to sign in. We have our shopping cart. We have a little, in case I feel like shopping for bold spring dresses, I can do that. We then also have a breakdown of where this person's work is in. This guy writes about science. But this guy writes both fiction and nonfiction. So I can see that I can look for his novels or I can look for his um, scientific work here. Then there's a list of products. If I click on any of these products, I get this, which again, same sort of stuff that was on this page. From the first page, that remains constant. Picture of the product, a description, add to cart, buy these two things together. It's amazing, by the way, how good Amazon is with some of the recommendations. Because I read both of these books, and they're, they're suggesting to sell them together. So that might have worked with me if I was shopping for these books. All right. Then there's a list of reviews. If we go in and look at another product, another book 
that this fellow wrote. Guess what we see? Picture of the product, description of it, by reviews, and so on. My point is, is that even though these pages have different content on them, their basic structure is the same, right? Just like every human might look different, the basic structure, the basic skeleton of humans are the same from person to person, all right? That's what we do in the skeleton phase. It's different from the structure phase. The structure phase is where we decide how we're going to break down our hundreds of pieces of content into a set of pages. In the skeleton phase, we decide what one page is going to look like, what the basic layout for one page is going to look like. All right, we'll talk more about this going forward. Lastly, we have the surface view. And the surface view isn't the organization, it's the appearance of individual pages. So this is the point where the font, the color, the other aspects of the appearance that people talk about when they talk about web design comes into play. So it's important. So one of the main steps is just not the first step. All right? It's put at the end. If you notice here, we go from really abstract sort of things, talking about goals and audience, to talk about specific content that we're going to put on the site, to talk about what pages we're going to have, to talk about how an individual page is going to look like, or, or I'm sorry, not look like, be laid out, and then finally what individual pages are going to look like. So we go from these sort of vague concepts down to something really specific and really tangible. All right? And this is a good process to go through to make sure that we indeed create websites that satisfy our aim as web developers. All right? Now, some folks, when they hear this, they kind of think, well, this is really common sense. Of course I'm going to think about what my users want. Of course I'm going to do that. On the other hand, I'm sure you've all heard that common sense isn't all that common all the time. All right? And I would put up as a case in point the fact that when you folks do whatever lab it is where you define the bad websites, no one in this class has ever had a hard time finding a bad website. So there's a lot of bad websites. I haven't had any person come up to me and say, you know, I looked at every site on the web and all of them were very well designed. All right? never happened and I don't suspect it's going to happen this term either. So the idea is my I guess my explanation of why that is you know if this is so common sense why are there so many bad websites is because people typically don't like to do the thinking and the planning they want to just dive in and start writing code. All right, dive in and start making web pages and throw something together and see if it sticks. What I'm suggesting instead is a more systematic approach where you think about what you're going to do before you do it. All right, look before you leap. Measure twice, cut once. There's, a, there's hundreds of, of little, little, little sayings relating to that. When I talk about design, again, I don't talk about design the way, say, a graphic designer would. That's all about fonts and colors and all that. I talk about design as being the planning of what you are going to do so that you end up doing the right thing. 
As a software developer, I, I can, and someone has done websites too, I can tell you that nothing is worse than spending a lot of time and effort developing a good solution for the wrong problem. All right, that has happened so many times. I, I uh, you know, that I can look back, both things that I've observed and even things I've participated in. All right, nothing is worse than that. Nothing is worse than creating something that, on a technical level, is good, but it doesn't really address the needs of the people that are going to be using that software or website. All right. So we want to make sure we understand those needs and goals and identify them before we start working things. We're going to design. We're going to plan. We're going to make choices deliberately. All right? I guess that's another word that I um, like to say when we talk about designs, that we're making choices and we're doing it deliberately. We're not letting it just fall to happenstance and like, well, that's what I, that's what I, you know, well, five pages seem to be a good number. No, we've thought about what content we've had, and we've thought about how many pages constitute a good number of pages for our site. All right. Next time, we will go over these in more detail, and we'll go over more examples. So they might be a little vague at this point, but again, you're going to create a document that has these five things in it. I have a sample document out there um, that contains four of the five things in the project folder. So be sure before next time you've read through the project assignment and you've looked at my sample because we'll talk about each of these steps and what's expected in each of these steps um, on Tuesday. All right, we'll see you in lab.